thank you for taking the time to come to this session. And um, it's kind of a, a passion of mine to try to encourage our men to write. And we're going to go over some of the reasons. I'm going to spend a little bit of time inspiring, I hope, uh, putting that dream in your heart. Um, Brother Starr, your message this morning, thank you. Brother, I sat that up there and sat out there and listened and thought, you said you were 64, is that right? And I thought, here's a 64-year-old man that's still wanting to learn how to do new things, discover new ways, and I think that's why God continues to use him. And that was a great message. I needed that. Thank you, sir. But I want to talk to you about this idea of... Um, being tender to the Holy Spirit's leading in your life concerning the possibility of putting some things in print. Let's pray, and we'll get right into it. Heavenly Father, Lord, there's a lot to cover, and we're going to try to do it in a timely fashion. But Lord, I pray, dear God, that you would take the information, Lord, that we give out, and then, of course, custom make it to each man's situation. Lord, to have your will in their life and to guide them accordingly. I pray, dear God, that you'd help us to have the maximum impact Lord, on this generation and the generations to come that we can. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you go to the last verse in the book of John, if you have your Bible, and if, if you don't have it quick and handy, I'll read it to you. I love this verse. It says, And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, every one, I suppose even the world itself could not the, contain the books that should be written. I love that little phrase, books that should be written. You know there's a difference between the word could and should. And he didn't say the books that could be, he said the books that should be. And so I think in, a, in essence what, what I want to stir your hearts about is the idea that I believe that every generation we need to produce material for our own generation and for future generations. You have that little fill out sheet in front of you and I'm going to give you real quickly, we're going to go through the outlines quickly. Matter of fact, one, two, three, um, I'm going to give you the three words to write in in the first three blanks, okay? There are books that should be written. So write the word written in there. There are books that should be written. Thank God for godly men and women who took the time to write. Previous generations, my life has been made better for it. Every generation should read the writings of the previous generation and also add something in print for future generations to follow. God may very well use you to write one of the books that should be written. Number two, there are books that should be read. And um, I like this. Paul uh, wrote to Timothy through inspiration, The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee and the books, but especially the parchments. You know, when you get to a friend's or a office and, and maybe another pastor study, what do you do? You kind of poke around and see what's on his shelf. I couldn't help but think, what books did Paul have? Can you imagine what those books were that he read that influenced him? And so we see that the Apostle Paul was influenced by authors. Uh, there were books that he needed, books that he read. His life was touched by books written by men who lived before him. Paul read what others wrote before him, and then God used him to write what uh, words that would influence the world. And he being dead, yet speaketh. And so there are, dead, uh, there are books that should be written, there are books that should be read, and then the last one, there are books that should be burned, amen? <laughs> Acts 19, and, that, and many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds, many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And folks, uh, this is my passion, I think uh, Brother Dameron hit it right on the head, we a lot of times are constantly warning the younger preachers, about who they're reading after. And so we don't want them reading after Calvinists. We don't want them reading after evangelicals. We don't want them getting caught up in the progressive church movement. But in all fairness, if they turned around and looked at you and me and said, okay, then what are we to read? You know, the evangelicals are producing things. That's one of the reasons they're winning, okay? And so we have to take the time to write. Walt Whitman said, he who touches a book touches a man, and in return is touched. So we have to be very careful what we read and who we let touch us. And so uh, if we're going to uh, caution our young men about what they need to read and tell them there's some things that are better, being, it's better to put it in a burn pile than it is to read it, then we need to hand them some things. So I want to challenge you in this hour to, to write 
Independent fundamental Baptist people need to write. I'm glad to see ladies in here. I will tell you this, ladies buy more books and read more books than men do. And if you've got something for ladies on a book table, more times than not, it will outsell anything that you have for the men on the book table. And so some of our Christian ladies, if God would so lead you, I would encourage you to consider uh, writing. Preachers, I know we're busy, okay? Uh, but I will tell you this, we need to, to put within our ministry the discipline of writing. So let's cover real quick five reasons preachers do not write. This is what you'll hear. You may have said these things. I've said these things before I started writing. We are too busy. We're too busy. Okay, well, writing is a discipline. Writing is work. Writing time must be scheduled like anything else. Okay, if it's important, you'll find a place to do it and a time to do it, and you fit it in your schedule. Okay, we're too busy. Well, okay, but we, we need to leave something for the next generation. Sometimes we are intimidated by the process. Okay, preacher, I don't know anything about writing. Well, if you are a reader of good material, then you know more about writing than you think. If you read good things, you know and are learning and know more than you think uh, just because you read good writing. And what you do not know, you can learn. One of the things that I'll throw in here, and you can take some notes on this along the side, but a lot of times uh, people say, you know, well, how do I... How do I learn about the writing craft? And, and writing is a craft, okay? I like, again, I was so pleased. When, brother, brother Starr, um, when you decided you were going to have to switch to RV living, would you say you wrote, read 30 books on it or something like that? Well, I smiled because when I decided that the Lord was burdening my heart to write, I read 30 books on writing before I wrote my first book. Gentlemen, we're living in the information age. Uh, there's a magazine that comes out called Writer's Digest. I'll tell you, it's a secular magazine. It's not a, it is not a, a Christian publication. But the entire periodical is dedicated to the craft of writing. The Writer's Digest Book Club. You can get online. You don't have to buy the magazine to get into the book club. But they, they're, they're, that is a great resource. Most of the books that I have purchased and read on writing, I got through the Writer's Digest Book Club. It's like anything else in life. If you want to learn to do it, you don't have to go to the local university. You don't have to go to journalism school. I knew I couldn't do that because, you know, it, it, I'm going to get frustrated. I don't need liberals teaching me. The, you know, if you can read, then you can learn. And if, it, But I do encourage you to do it. Listen to me. Let me I'm, I'm not being critical. But a lot of guys think, well, okay, I want to publish a book. So you'll preach a series of messages on a Wednesday night. You'll take the, the, the uh, CDs, you'll hand them to a secretary, transcribe these, throw them in a book, there I wrote a book. That is not reading, a writing, that is preaching. It is, and, and let me say this, sorry, but if your name's, last name's not Spurgeon, I don't really care to read your sermons. No more than you probably care to read mine. Because you know what, half of mine I stole from somebody else and half of yours you stole from somebody else too. And I'm just saying, a lot of times what people are doing, they're wanting to put out sermon books, okay? And you just have to answer this question for yourself. How many sermon books have you read in the last 10 years? Now, do you want to write so that you can feel good that your name's on something? If that feels a need in your life, then do it. Or do you want to impact a generation? We need writers, okay? And writing is a craft. It's different than preaching, okay? To be able to take this wonderful thing called words, and to be able to, to put them in a, in a way to, to convey a message that touches heart and changes opinions. Folks, listen to me. It is a craft, and it's like any other craft. You can learn it, okay? If I can learn it, you can learn it, okay? And so, but, but it takes some preparation, all right? Number three, we are weak in our knowledge of grammar, okay? Well, you know what? That's probably true in many of our lives. When I went off to Bible college, I... Uh, they, they had me take an English placement test to see whether or not I would be able to go into freshman level, uh, freshman level, uh, college level English, or I'd have to be put into what they called bonehead English. And uh, yeah, I ended up in the bonehead English class, okay, that's what we called it. I don't think that was the official, it was non-credit English. And the English teacher, the first day I was in the class, uh, finished the class, the first introductory class, and then he said, uh, is Jerry Ross here? 
you know, and uh, see me after class. And so I went up there, and he said, uh, Mr. Ross, I wanted to shake your hand. Okay. He said, uh, you are now the new record holder for the lowest score ever on the English grammar placement <laughs> test in the history of our college. I just wanted to know who you are. And I said, I didn't know whether it's to be glad. It was this, <laughs> uh, okay, I, you know, do I get a plaque? <laughs> And he, he basically said to me, he said, um, now he said, are you called to preach? By the way, this man did me a great favor. Listen to me. Are you called to preach? Yes, sir, I am. He said, I want you to understand something. You will never get a diploma from this college until you decide that you're going to learn the English language. He says, words are your craft. And he says, you've been dodging it your whole life. You don't strike me as a dumb kid, so you're, you're, you've been dodging it. You, you don't know it because you don't want to learn it. You skated through high school, and he was right. You know why I didn't know it? It's not that I couldn't have learned it. I didn't want to learn it. I didn't think, see any importance of it. And so he said, I'm going to tell you right now, I will never let you out of this class. You will take it until you learn it. And I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you know what I did? I buckled down, and I learned grammar. And I learned English language. I've written a introductory grammar handbook for our high school. Jerry Ross did that, the guy that scored the lowest. Listen, if you want to learn something, you can learn it, okay? Number four, we do not know what to write. Well, preacher, I don't, I don't know what to write. I mean, good night. What, what in the world do I write? Now, this is the key. This is where we're going to get into something, okay? Look for needs. Look for needs, okay? Be a need filler. Again, some people will write because they have a need. They have the need to see their name on a book, okay? Now you've serviced, you've, you've done something for yourself. But what I do is I listen. As you go around and as you interact with preachers, um, listen to where the frustration points are. Listen to where we're, the areas where we're failing, okay? Uh, 1996, Dr. Lee Robertson was in our church and he preached in our church for a weekend, I think a meeting. It was my job, my dad was pastor then, my job was to basically stay at his elbow and watch over him and his wife, make sure they were taken care of, and from time to time we'd be alone, and he, uh, he looked over at me one day when we were just in the middle aisle of our church, and everybody had kind of gone, and he said, uh, now Brother Jerry, what do you do here again? I said, I work with the young people. He said, oh, I need you to do me a favor. I said, what? He said, our young people, they're marrying out of the will of God. They're marrying out of the will of God. He said, I think that most of our young people are missing it in this matter of finding God's perfect will in a marriage partner. And he said, your generation, you have to do something about this. You have to do something about this. And then he just turned around and walked away. And you know what? I began to talk and, and look and watch and talk to other youth pastors. And you know what? He's right. By the way, a lot of young people are still marrying out of the will of God. Seems like when a, the, the devil can't get them in any other area of their life and they stand up against any te temptation, a good kid, the devil sends a counterfeit. Next thing you know, they won't listen to anybody. They end up out of the will of God. They mess their lives up. And so there was a need. I heard about a need. That's where the Stay in the Castle book came from. That's where the seven royal laws of courtship come from. It's to try to shore up an area where we are failing and give young people something that will help them to want to make the right decision. And then the Bible principles, how? You know, Stay in the Castle is inspirational. It's just a story to want to put it in the heart of a kid. Yeah, I want to marry in God's perfect will. But inspiration without instruction won't last. So the seven laws of courtship is here's the Bible principles that if you will dedicate yourself to and vow to follow, it will lead you to God's perfect will in a marriage part. Now you've got two things. By the way, these are not large books. And I want to encourage a lot of you when you go to writing, some of you may think, well, I need to write huge things, or, you know, I've got to impress people with the size of the book. Do you realize, especially with young people, that if they can't read it in 20, 30 minutes, they're not going to read it. They may have your book, but ask them if they've ever read it. We're in a, in a generation that wants bite-sized, quick information. I uh, noticed on one of the tables, and I can't remember whose it was in the foyer, but uh, the, the brother, uh, Ramos, the little booklets, the teen series or truth series, or what was that called? What is it? Walk in truth. Those type of little bite-sized pamphlets, I'm telling you, are gold. By the way, John Rice, sort of the Lord pamphlets. He was a genius before his time. He understood. A lot of people aren't going to read this, but you can take and deal with small, singular issues 
in a, in a pay, and, and you know what? You can produce them very inexpensively, okay? This is called saddle stitching. Most people would call it staples. If it's stapled, it's called saddle stitching. If it's glue uh, bound books, that we call them perfect bound books, that's without the staples. This obviously is a little more expensive to produce than this. And we'll get into some more of those specifics, but it's doable, okay? And by the way, you know what? You said that looked like it came from the 70s because that it did. But listen, do not make shortcuts. Well, they don't, you, you can't judge a book by its cover. Everyone does. Okay, listen, we need to make our material sharp, first class. Four cl this is called a four-color cover. Okay, four-color covers, what those are called, all right? Make sure that you do a sharp, you know, well, I don't know how to do this. We'll get into some answers for all of those things, okay? But you don't know what to write? Look for needs. Um, we had a, a man in our church that uh, was a Vietnam vet, and uh, he got saved, and he got a real burden for soldiers. And all of a sudden, I think there's this entire group of veterans out here that are a mission field. And there's a lot of military mission. But Brother Ron Allen had such a unique Vietnam vet testimony that we, I interviewed him, went over to his house, and every Tuesday night for about uh, three months, I'd throw a little tape recorder in the middle of his coffee table, and I'd interview him, get him telling stories, and we wanted to produce a tool. Again, this is uh, stapled. Um, it is uh, 60 pages, I think, or something like that. And you know what it does? It tells about his Vietnam War experiences, but at the end, it gives the plan of salvation. Every, the, the cover is designed so that if you're military, everything that you see on that cover, the minute you glance at it, if you've got any type of military background, there's something you see that you want to go, what's that? Okay, it's designed to reach an unreached people's group. Are there other things that are for military? Absolutely. Hey, we could use 20 more things. Okay, so uh, look for unre unreached people groups. And I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But you know what? How do you decide what to write? You look for needs, okay? By the way, here's a good question. What is it you wish was out there that you could purchase? You know, I finally dedicated myself to do something. And if I knew the amount of work, I wouldn't have agreed to do it. But where, you know what I hear everywhere when I'm interacting with uh, youth pastors and pastors is we need good Bible-based, there's a lot of fluff out there, but good, solid Bible-based curriculum for teen training hour, for teen Sunday school classes. Brother Ross, you did it for 11 years. Where's all the stuff you taught? Well, it's in this file, it's in that file, it's on this, it's on that. Could you put it together? I've got the first volume, 104 teen training lessons, Okay. We're working on the second, 104 is two years worth if you use one a week. So that's two years. Okay, here's a layman in your church, because most churches are never going to be able to hire a youth pastor, not a full-time youth pastor. So a lot of people are using laymen. I'll, I'll do it, preacher, but what do I do? Here's two years. I'm getting volume two done, so eventually here's four years. You only have them six years. Okay, so that's four of the years. That, that doesn't include the teenage years of Jesus Christ, the books on masculinity, femininity, by the way, why did you write them? Because I'm listening, and you know what I keep hearing over and over again? Man alive, guys are getting more and more feminine, girls are getting more and more masculine. And by the way, guys are getting more and more feminine, girls are getting more and more masculine. Listen, whatever you're complaining about, and you hear everybody else complaining about, we can sit around and whine about it all we want. We need Bible-based answers. How do we turn the tide? How do we stop it? So I wrote the book, the uh, 21... Tenets of Biblical Masculinity. It's a study of the phrase young man or young men in the Bible. My, I, I did the Bible part of the femininity. This is the book that's run my life. The, all right, this is a whole other story. But I did the Bible study part of the femininity book. My wife did the writing to talk to the young ladies. Older ladies, elder ladies teach the younger. But my wife has such integrity that she wouldn't let me publish it with just her name on it. So this book, The 21 Tenets of Biblical Femininity, has Jerry Ross, Jerry and Cheryl Ross's name. I didn't foresee what kind of issues that was going to create in my life until after we got it out. The phone rings in the office. I pick it up. Hello, Pastor Ross, can I help you? Oh, your brother Ross. Yeah, yes, yeah, brother. Yeah, can I help you? Oh, your insights to, to femininity is revolutionized. <laughs> The ladies in our church. And, you know, at this point, I'm just staring at the receiver going, my ministry's over. It's not, I'm done. So what do I do? I think, you know, in times of despair, when you're wanting to, 
Uh, so I, I have a handful of preacher friends, I, friends, and I text them, I group text them and said, and this is what I sent them, I said, I, I'm going to have to kill myself. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, they text back, well, what, what? And I'm like, I got this lady that called and she thinks I'm the preacher that has insights to biblical femininity, I'm going to have to kill myself. Which, you know, these are preacher friends. And you think you'd get some encouragement. <laughs> For the next hour, all they're doing is texting me very masculine ways to commit suicide. <laughs> That's what I get for an hour, you know. That's, brother, i got to get some new friends. I really need a new friend. I, mean, I won't tell you what all of them were, but one of them involved a four-wheel drive truck, a case of dynamite, and a cigar. Okay, that's, that's all the information I'm giving out. But uh, that's the kind of help I got. All right, so look for needs. If you're hearing or you see something in your ministry and there's a tendency, there's a problem area, you know what? Here's, here's a classic thing that we, this is separates leaders from the average person. The average person can identify problems. You've got them in your church, they come to you all the time. Pastor, pastor, this is going on, pastor, this is going on. They, they identify problems. Very few people are, are able to solve problems. It's not our jobs to just identify problems and sit around and whine about them. It's our job to identify the problems and then bring a solution to help fix the problem. And so that's what you can do in your writing. All right, number five, we cannot afford to publish what we write. And I'm going to get into this a little bit in our question and answer time. But the honest truth is with the technology that's now available, publishing is very affordable. Self-publishing can be both affordable and profitable. But you have to understand the pros and cons, and I think we'll get into that in just a bit. All right, the benefits of writing. This is where I'm going to try to talk you into doing it, okay? Writing challenges you to rationally and biblically hammer out your belief system. Now, folks, listen to me. This is the truth. We've become a movement of half-thought-out pulpit cliches. There's a lot of things that people are saying, and, and then they say it with excitement, and, and everybody says amen, and I'm sitting out there thinking, that's not even biblical, okay? We just, listen, you know what writing will do? If you're going to write about a subject, and you're going to, give a Bible-based presentation of that subject, there's no way to cut corners. There's nowhere to hide. It's in black and white. You've got to study it out. And you, you know what this will do? It'll cause you, now watch this, it'll cause you to figure out what is your preferences and what is your convictions. Okay? And we all need to have convictions. But I'm just saying, you know what you need to do? You need to study it out. You know why a lot of our kids aren't following some of the things we wish they would, because we have not given them a proper Bible-based presentation of why it's enough that, so that they can adopt it as a Bible conviction. And so writing will challenge you to rationally and biblically hammer out your belief system. Writing will force you to slow down and line upon line, precept upon precept, learn to explain what you believe. I'm not asking you to change anything you believe. I'm just asking you to, to take the time to make sure that you can, in printed form, you know, why, why do we, why do, here's a new convert, comes to your church. Preacher, why do the ladies dress the way they do? Here, take this, here's a Bible, here's a pamphlet. I want you to look at the verses, I want you to be tender to the Holy Spirit. Here's the Bible-based reasons for where we're at. Not just, bless God, because people who don't are hussies. Brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> Wave goodbye to them as they go to the evangelical church down the road. And it's not their fault. It's our fault, okay? So they need some good materials, okay? Number two, writing will make you more eloquent and convincing as a preacher. Now, folks, here's the honest truth, and I'm as guilty as anybody to listen to what I'm going to say. I'm not throwing rocks. Reading, if we read, take the time to read sermons of the previous generation. Pick up a sermon written 100 years ago, 150 years ago, and we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. That's the honest truth. And, and I'm going to tell you something, we, we, we've dumbed down everything in this society, including our sermons. Now, let me just kind of challenge you, boy, I, I've got a heart for this, and I don't know, I'll say what I say, and if, if I'm wrong, then just say that dumb guy didn't know what he was talking about. But we've got to, in our homiletics classes, teach our young men to take the time to write out their introductions. The hardest part for a young preacher to do is to get started properly. And you know what? If he would take the time to write out the first couple paragraphs, you mean word for word? I mean write it out. 
so that it's eloquent, it makes sense, it properly presents where we're going. You know, if a young person can get, if a young preacher can get started well and can finish strong, the, the, the middle will kind of take care of itself. But even every point, every point of his sermon, whether what he's got written, I think young men ought to write out a lot more of their sermon than they do. If, if young preachers in their 20s are walking up and they've got everything on one piece of paper scribbled out and they've got, you know, six words and a couple little pictures and, you know, and you know what? I'm listening to their sermon thinking they got six words and a couple little pictures. And you know what? I just want to go play golf, okay? I'm, I want out of there, all right? Now, come on. Uh, and again, this will help them to be more eloquent and convincing as a preacher. Train yourself to write out sermon illustrations, sermon summaries, key points, so that when you get done preaching a point, you can look down and five or six well-thought-out, well-written sentences to drive it home, and then point number two. And we ought to write out more of our sermons than we do. It's a good practice. Number three, writing provides you with an opportunity to impact your generation. The evangelicals are winning because they take the time to write, Providing written materials for our independent fundamental Baptist churches not only meet a need, they give you a vo voice in what is being taught. I'm just going to say it out loud. You know why I decided to do the 104 lessons? Not that there aren't other guys that could do it. Could I just say this? I wanted to have a voice in what is being taught to our young people. Because you know what? There's a lot of issues that are not being addressed. I've worked for 30 years with young people. I know what they struggle with. I know what they need to hear. I know what we're glossing over. And I'm going to write Bible-based curriculum, and it's not going to be fluff. And it's going to, you know, I tell people all the time, listen, Jerry Ross doesn't write about any, everything. And, but, but if you go read something I've written, and you disagree with it, come talk to me, but bring your Bible. Because I promise if you read it, what I wrote, my Bible the Bible, that I, the, the Bible basis of my belief is written clearly for you. I'm a little tired of this generation to just read something that's Bible-based, and well, I just don't agree with that. Right. Well, so what? Big deal. I mean, you know, all right, why don't you? Where's the verses that you base your beliefs on? Because I've given you mine. Amen. And I'm not saying I'm right about everything. I'm saying bring the Bible. Amen. And if you ain't going to bring the Bible, then you know what? I don't much care to hear what you don't agree with, you know. They don't agree with it because they don't want to agree with it, not because it's not right. And the Bible gives us then, you know, the foundation for where we stand there, okay? Uh, number four, writing allows you to influence future generations. And so, you know what, I'm 50, I'll turn 55 this year. If I get my three score and 10, I've got 15 years left. Uh, you know what, watch this, folks. All right, I, I like to do this in my church here once in a while. It's good for all of us preachers to hear this. How many, how many of you know the name of your parents? Raise your hand. All right, not a trick question. You can name all four of your grandparents. Okay, they'll just get a little harder. You can name all eight of your great-grandparents. Be careful, I might call on you. It's these genealogy people that probably know it, all right? The genealogy. i seen one hand. All right, news flash. Two generations from now, no one's going to know your name. By the way, so let's get over ourselves a little bit. We're not all that as important as we think. So two generations from now, my own family can't remember my name. All right, reset button. All right. Okay, so what I'm saying is this. The only chance I have to influence a generation or two away from me is for one of my grandchildren to pick up a book and say, wow, great-grandpa wrote this. Or somebody from Blessed Hope Baptist Church pick up something. It gives me a chance to influence beyond my lifetime. And, and I want to influence future. You know what? John Rice and other people that's taken time to write, and there's, you know, Spurgeon, all, they are still racking up rewards in heaven. And they've been dead for, for decades. Because what they left in print is still influencing people, seeing them save training preachers. Man, I want to have that legacy. Forgive me for being a little selfish, but I want, all, I want to lay up treasures for heaven. I want the judgment seat of Christ to be a good experience. Okay? Now, listen. Maximize the potential of everything you do. I'm, I'm going to give you this little philosophy. Everything that I put the work in to do, and I put work into it, I don't have to do it, I don't have to study it, and guys, we have got to turn 
our offices back into pastor studies or get you a study away from the church if you have to. But we need to become students of the Bible again. Don't publish something that's half studied out because you're just going to embarrass yourself because somebody with more Bible knowledge is going to walk up and say, did you consider this verse, this verse? And by the way, once it's in print and it's out there, there ain't no getting it back. So make sure, okay? Make sure that it's studied out and, stu- and, and make sure that you do, do a good job. But listen, if I put the study into a Wednesday night series and God gets his hand on it and it really genuinely helps my people, you know what most of us do with that? We put it in a file, we save it in a folder on our computer and it sits there and that's all that work you did helped one little group of people. So what, if you've done the work, why not maximize the potential of it? You know why I like Christian radio? Because I'm, I'm going to prepare, and I'm going to study, and I'm going to work, and I'm going to preach a message on a Sunday night, and I'm going to preach on a Sunday night our church to maybe 175, 200 people. But if I can take, listen, I put the work into it already. It's there. Okay? It, it's, it's been recorded. Why not try to get it? On a radio station, or two, or five, or seven, or twelve, if I'm already, listen, I want to, everything I'm going to put the work into, I want to maximize the potential of it. Does that make sense to you? So if we're going to do it anyway, let's take it to another level. You've got that material. It wouldn't be that hard to rewrite it in book form. I'm not saying every series you preach, whatever, but you're going to know sometimes when God just gets in on one and, man, it had a supernatural effect in our church, and if it can help here, it can help other people. And listen to the Holy Spirit and uh, maximize uh, everything that you do. All right, quickly, uh, I said that about future generations. Five, six, and seven, and then we'll get into some uh, nuts and bolts. Writing allows you, number five, writing allows you to influence people outside of your Jerusalem. I believe in the both philosophy. What is that? Acts 1-8, we heard it last night. Both in Jerusalem, Judea. That means simultaneously. That means this, I believe a little church in Jasonville, Indiana ought to have a worldwide impact. I don't just say it, I believe it. I don't believe we should just impact our Jerusalem. I believe we ought to impact southern Indiana. I believe we ought to impact America. By the way, I believe a small town country preacher ought to have a worldwide impact. Now, one of the ways that you can do that is write. Okay, my books have gone places I'll never get to. Okay, and and that's exciting. There's hardly any place, I'm just telling you, and I've, I've had... Um, again, I just, I'm doing this to encourage you. Okay? I'm not, I don't need accolades. I don't need a pat on the back. I'm way past all, any of that stuff. But I never go anywhere in this country without somebody coming up and said, I read this, I read this, I read this. Me and my wife both read your stay in the castle as teenagers. We made a decision, committed to God. God brought us together. We've been wanting to meet you. Thank, you know, folks, that's valuable. I don't want to just influence my congregation, Jason Ball. I want to do as much as I can to bring as much good and help and reinforcements to other ministries that I possibly can. And so you have the ability to do that too. Number six, write, writing for many preachers becomes a relaxing hobby. And you know what? Whether you publish or not, I think that you all need a healthy, productive, we all do need a healthy, productive escape. Writing is therapeutical, and it, it does, and, and it may, may, be, may not be that for you, but for a lot of preachers, it, it really is. Number seven, writing can provide a second source of income for a pastor and evangelist. You say, oh, and by the way, we, I'm just going to try to help everybody in here get over this, and maybe you're not trapped in this world. But I'm going to say it out loud, and you need to listen to me. This whole idea that if you earn a dollar outside of your ministry salary, sometimes somehow that's carnal, is ridiculous. It's not carnality, it's capitalism. What are you, communist? <laughs> All right, stop being shamed into thinking that if you earn a dollar outside of ministry, then somehow that's carnal. And by the way, if you do, you have to make sure you bring it to your church and give it to missions. Hey, listen, come on. Folks, nobody's getting rich in the ministry. And you know who sacrifices the most? Gentlemen, our wives and our children. And when you finally get that vacation time, maybe a couple weeks a year, wouldn't it be nice to have a little money to actually take the family to do something? Writings helped put our girls through Bible college. Writings allowed me and my wife to go places and take trips that we wouldn't have been able to do. Okay? Writing has allowed me to give to missions in a way. The Stay in the Castle books have been published in seven different languages. 
Nobody on the mission field has ever paid one penny for a copy of Stay in the Castle. Me and my wife personally financed to see that everybody that's on the mission field gets it for nothing. I couldn't do that if it wasn't for the fact that we have an additional income because of our writing. So I want you to get over that, okay? Our wives and our children sacrifice hugely in a lot of areas, okay? Don't be put on a guilt trip because you're making some money off of another source of income and use it for right, use it for good as the Holy Spirit would lead you. But man, we've just put ourselves on such crazy guilt trips that we need to stop, okay? Everybody hear me? All right, good, all right. Now, let me get into just a couple nuts and bolts thing, and then I'm going to get Brother Starr, and who else was it? Yes, Brother Olson, and I'm going to have them bring them to the front with me, and then I'm going to let you ask questions, okay? Preacher, where do, where do I start? Well, all right, let me give you a quick thing. I just want to get you a starting place. Number one, I already mentioned it, but start ordering some books about writing and read about the craft. Begin to study the craft. Okay, so read about uh, your writing. Number two, start on your sermon preparation. Take the time to write your introduction, write your conclusion, and write out part of your sermons. That may not sound like a big deal, but it's going to get you into the habit of writing things that are convincing and powerful and strong. All right, number, th number three, I hope I'm not going too quick here. One of the best writing disciplines that you can do, and one of the best things that helped me early on, Tony Brown from Ellettsville, Indiana, I'll tell you the quick story, called me one day and said, I want to put a teen devotional, like a, kind of like a daily bread type booklet for teenagers called Glow in the Dark, and I'd like to see if you'd write for, for those things. Now, let me tell you what's so great about it. He's a friend. Honestly, Brother Dameron, I didn't want to do it because I had so much to do, but he's a friend. I said, okay. Me and Tony at the beginning, when he first started publishing them, you know, it'd be 60 devotionals, two months worth, and he'd write 20 of them, and I'd write 25 of them. I mean, it was crazy at first, till we finally got enough guys involved where they were writing them. But let me tell you, I'm not promoting glow in the dark. This is what I'm telling you. It, 250 words limit is what you had to do. You had to grab a teenager's attention with a thought, hold that interest, and make sure that they got the point, the delivery of it, the concept, and you had to do it in 250 words. Now, I want you to, if you want to just do an exercise for fun, just say, okay, I'm going to pretend that I'm writing for Glow in the Dark or some kind of a devotional, and I'm going to pick a subject or a thought, and then I'm going to write it. And you know what? In a very, then you're going to do it the first time, and you're going to say, okay, wow. And then you're going to hit word count, and you're going to, it's going to say 425 words. And you're going to go, are you kidding me? And it's only got to be 250. One of the things, you, it, this is a great thing for you. Preachers were too wordy. It's not so bad in our preaching, but in our writing, we're too wordy. Okay, we call it in the craft, writing tight. You got to learn to write tight. How can I say the same things that it took me 450 words to say? How can I write that in 250 words? You know what it does? It makes you go back and look at every sentence. All right? I repeated myself here. I, these three sentences I could say in one sentence, and most of the time, three spoken sentences could have been said in one. All right? Remember, you only got them for a short amount of time. Everything's got to be power-packed. All right? So you're going to have to go back in, and they, again, they call it in the craft. <laughs> they call it killing your babies in the secular world because everybody that writes something falls in love with it because it's yours. Well, I can't cut 200 words out of this. Yeah, you can. But I'd have to take out that whole paragraph, and you're just looking at this, and you sweated it over, and, and, and you poured your life, and, and you've got well, you've to highlight it and hit delete. <laughs> but you know what? Most of the, there's nothing that you've written, 450 words, that you couldn't rewrite 250 words, because most of us, when we start out, are too wordy. We wander, we say, we repeat. We think we've got to get flowery. Writing that's effective is to the point. To the point, say it. Okay? So uh, I would suggest that. Uh, next, schedule writing time. Preacher, when am I going to find time to do it? You've got to schedule it. Okay? It's like any other thing. Where do you find time to study for your sermons? Where do you find time to go soul winning? Where do you find time? Well, I don't have time. Yeah, yeah, you do. If it's important to you, you'll find the time. Most of us find time to watch more TV than we should. 
Find time to do a lot of other things. Look, you know what I found out about preachers? And this is true of the pulpit and the pew. If you want to do something, you'll find time to do it. If you want to buy something, you'll find the money to get it. That's America. So if you want to do this, you'll find the time. So schedule the time to do it. All right, now there's a lot of nuts and bolts things. I've, this is more about inspiration. Now I want to give you information. Brother Starr, would you come? Brother Olson, why don't you come up here? And I'll defer a lot to these guys because if I don't know, I'll just look at them and say, I don't know, Brother Starr, tell them, you know. Do you have questions about this? Okay. And you may have specific questions. I brought a sampling of my books up here. If you want to ask specifics about how, what, where, how much, I will do the best I can, and maybe these guys can help me. Because, see, I don't know how, who you use to print and publish yours. He uses somebody different than me. He probably uses some. But there's more information here, okay? Questions? Yes, I'm sorry? Um, okay, there's several different things. I do a lot of different ways, and then you, you can answer this. Um, this was one of the first things we did. There's a place called Morris Press in Kernsey, Nebraska. Say, why do you have a secular place called Morris Press in Kernsey, Nebraska, print stained the castle? Because when we were researching printing this, and we were early on, we didn't know anything about it, one of their stock covers was this. Now imagine this, I'm looking at it, and it doesn't have stay in the castle, it's just got the picture. My wife's like, you're going to believe this, come look at this. And so this company has been super good at this. I've never taken it away from them. They, they, are, they are very inexpensive. They do, we have great communication with them. We build a great relationship with them. They haven't raised the price of printing this in seven years. I don't even know why, I can't explain it. Everything else has gone up, so we've done that. Bearing Precious Seed in Milford, Ohio, has done the uh, Mountain Lessons book, uh, Biblical Femininity, Biblical Masculinity. Um, I am, have kind of built a relationship with them. Uh, Sam Cottle is my, kind of my go-to guy, Bearing Precious Seed in Milford, Ohio. Um, and so they do that. This one we do, we have World Arts in Spencer, Indiana, which is next door to us. They print the cover. We don't now, we've had Bearing Precious Seed do this one uh, when we do big giant projects, but we have our own church people put these together. We, print the, we have just the cover printed and delivered. We print the inside ourselves, and our people hand put these together, and that gives them a, our senior saints a chance, kind of like you do the John and Romans and that kind of thing. So I guess the answer is I go to, I do it a lot of different ways. Who, who uh, prints yours? Okay. To begin with. But Morris requires uh, you get discounts and you have to order 750 to 1,000 to get the uh, kind of discount that you want. I was laying out $1,600 to $2,000 just, and then I had to inventory all those in my house, and it was eating our house up. So we switched to Unger in Canada, and Unger prints. Blank. It doesn't matter if you order 25 or 2,000, it's the same price per item. Now, they stockpile it, and I, I get an order on my website. I send it to them by email. They ship it out, and I don't have to handle it. That's called drop shipping, and that's wow. great. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Does Unger also, would they take care of an e-book? Do they do the e-book if they, you wanted it on Kindle or Amazon or not? Do you have yours on ebooks yet? E Tell them about that. I, well, I'm not much as big on ebooks, but I did one on ebook, and I just downloaded from Amazon how to do it, and I followed the formatting and uploaded it. And so I, I didn't have to have to pay anybody to do it. I did the same thing, and I didn't do it as professionally as I'd like. Uh, Bill Hardecker did, and it was $400 for one book, and he hasn't sold any. I did it myself, and I get a transfer every month from Amazon Man. for our books. Every hey, you set up a PayPal account, tie it to Amazon as they sell your books, that money just flows into your PayPal it's account. Not big money. I'm talking yeah. yeah. Anywhere from nine to eighteen dollars. What nine to eighteen dollars? Uh, CreateSpace is the branch of Amazon. If you go if you wanted to 
publish your first book and preach your, I, I can't afford a thousand, printing of a thousand, you can have them print one and send it to you. Create Space will, will if you get on there, they'll do, provide both a hard copy and a digital copy that, that you can put on Amazon. And, you know, I know Amazon is marketing to a different group than our group, but can I say something? If all we're doing is writing books to sell to the choir, to people that already agree with us, then what influence are we having? I think we've got to stop this idea again that if we cross over into the secular, that I think that's the whole idea, isn't it? Is to try to influence the world. And I'm not, I'm, I'm, I mean, I know the Holy Spirit's got to dictate where our separation lines are, but folks, writing allows me to go into arenas that I personally would not go into myself as far as association or preaching. Okay, and if we're just going to stand in judgment of each other, but you ought to do a little history of the Sword Lord publishing in the earlier days. Well, they were in secular Christian bookstores all over America, and they, were, they crossed denominational lines, and they influenced, I'm saying through their publications. I'm not saying the men personally did, but through their publications, they were to, able to influence a lot of people into fundamentalism. We've just isolated ourselves where we print books, give it to our people, sell it to a few other preachers, and we're not influencing, touching anybody outside our realm. So, you know, be a little brave in this. And are you going to get criticized? What, what do you do in this world in, in fundamentalism where you don't get criticized for it? So uh, I'm going to do right and let the Lord worry about that. Question? Of time? Yes, I will tell you how I do it. Um, I, I pastor. You may be, be interested in you now as an evangelist because of our different schedule stuff. But my writing, I find that I've got to pick my times as a pastor. Uh, J December, January, and February, we scale back our calendar and our church down to minimum because of the weather and because of the holidays. That frees me up. That three months' time, I do a lot of writing. Then we get into the spring attendance campaign and, and spring revivals and all the stuff. Gentlemen, you're going to have times where maybe three months, I don't even, I don't write a word. Summers, I preach in teen camps and stuff. I'll tell you something, when I go out to preach, which I do some, if I go somewhere, drive or fly, and I'm in a motel for a couple days, oh, it's great. Because I can't get the amount of work done in my office that I can when I'm away from my office. I think you guys understand that. So I'll sequester myself away, and I don't sleep well when I'm not at home. So if I'm not going to sleep well, I might as well do something. And so I'll get back from preaching an evening revival service, go in my room, and I may write till 2 or 3 or 4 in the morning. And then I'll sleep for 3 or 4 hours, and then I'll get up, and then I, you know, I'll catch up later. But I just got to pick my times to do it. Um, and, and, but I'm, we're not, me and my wife are not big TV people. When we go home in the evening, now understand too, this is different. When the kids were still at home, it was really hard to write at home. Now that we're empty nesters, I do a lot of my study for sermons and my writing at home of an evening because we eat supper, you know, me and my wife talk for a while, and then I sit over my recliner, I get my laptop out, I'll write a chapter, half a chapter, whatever. She, she likes to read, I like to write, and well, that's kind of what we do. So depending on the time of life, it's a little more. How do you do it on the road as far as, do you have a consistent weekly schedule of writing? Okay. As a pastor, when I was pastor, I'm not an early person. But in order to write, I got, I got so disgusted I didn't have time to write, but I wanted to write. So I set the alarm two days a week, 5 o'clock in the morning, and got up and spent two hours writing every morning to write the first Awesome. Um, on the road, it's blocked. Evangelists don't get a lot of meetings in Arizona in the wintertime. <laughs> So that's wintertime. Uh, this summer we're going to be in an area where I think I'll have a, a month. So I'll spend some time. Amen. I, I do most of mine in the evening. I spend a lot of time in the evening. And I, I'll start writing. And when I'm on a roll, I'm on a roll. And I think you guys know what that means. Mm -hmm. And there are times when you're writing and it, you're getting nowhere. Sometimes you have to walk away from it. But sometimes you, you just have to push through it. Maybe after an hour or something, it starts clicking, and then you can start moving with it. And then 
let me say this too, there are times where you're working on a project and you're working on it and you're working on it and then after a while you just absolutely get sick of it. Mm. And you have to set it aside and walk away and don't touch it. There are times that there's some things I haven't touched for, for months. Uh, there's one project, uh, the Money by the Book project, I set it aside for almost a year. <laughs> I got a bunch done on it because I'm sick of this. And I just set it aside and I came back and I finished it uh, last year. So it just takes time is all it is. Yeah. Good. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Well, okay, I was going to finish that thought. Thank you for bringing it up. Here's the thing, guys. Listen. If you, you say, I'm not going to write for that, for what he just said. You know what? The, my wife proofs my stuff. I write, she fixes it. I've got proofreaders that fix it. Now, don't get me wrong. You do need to understand, because she can't do it. There's a difference between an oil change and an overhaul. Okay. You need to be strong in your grammar because you need to, But I'm going to tell you something. Here's the thing. When I write, I break grammar rules sometimes for effect. It's fine as long as you know you're breaking them. What's sad is when you're doing it and you don't know you're breaking them. I'll break it in the pulpit. I preach to rednecks. I do. I, down in Southern, I preach a bunch of crazy hillbillies. I'll get up and preach. And it, sometimes if you go online and listen to me, you think this is the biggest dork. I mean, he don't even know. You know why? Because I'm preaching to my crowd. And by the way, I'm raised there and I know how to talk what they, I know how to do it. Okay? But I know that I'm doing it. Okay, don't become a snob. You know, if, I, if you stood up and preached perfectly uh, a sermon and everything was absolutely grammatically correct, people halfway through would be going, ew, you know, what's wrong with him? You know, so... I guess the answer is learn grammar, know it, but also understand there's times when you can. But get in less help in this. You know, get a proofread. I don't proofread my stuff. You can't proofread your own stuff because you'll read it seven times and you know, your brain knows what you meant and, and it knows so it, it doesn't see it. You hand it to somebody else and they'll say, what the, how did I miss that? You know, yes. Correct. Right. I agree with that. I agree with that. And that's what I said about, you know, be careful just taking your sermons, handing them over, typing them. Because there is a difference between writing and speaking. Now, it's for instance, and again, the mountain book, okay? We went, me and Doug Castle went uh, elk hunting last fall. I came home and I just took the entire time in the Montana mountains and everything the Lord would teach me, I'd just take my cell phone out, I'd use the uh, note app and I'd write these cool things down. I just, oh, that is awesome. I got home and I preached on a Wednesday night, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I thought I'd just do one night, three messages about what I called mountain lessons. Uh, then I got to thinking, man, there's a tool. I need a tool to reach the outdoorsmen in our area. We've got hunters and outdoorsmen. And everybody in Indiana's dream that hunts is to one day go to out west and hunt elk. So I put this little book together called uh, Mountain Lessons. And it teaches character lessons. What, and there's a lot of humorous things to it. But I would even say this. I know the audience I'm writing to. This is a lot more casual writing because of the guys I'm going to be handing it to than it would be if I was trying to reach doctors or lawyers or educators, college professors with the gospel. So even your writing sometimes can carry on a certain casual dialect that you got to keep in mind, we did the same thing with the soldier book. Everything I read in that book, wrote in that book, I wrote the entire book, but I gave it to Ron Allen. And I said, Ron, the way I write you're going to say, because I that need this has to be a soldier talking to a soldier. They are their own community, guys. Okay? I mean, they are. And they're not going to listen to me like they'd listen to a mil another military guy. 
So he literally went through every paragraph and he'd say, Preacher, a soldier would never say that. They wouldn't say it like that. And so did we break rules in this? Yeah. But again, we're tailor-making it to reach the men and women that live in this culture. So, okay. All right. Anything else? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I don't have that list in front of me. Um, I've got, like I said, here's the best thing. Why I'm trying to get you to go to Writer's Digest Book Club is there are not broad-based. The books are very narrow and very specific. And I'll tell you what you'll do. You'll look at the titles, and you'll immediately identify your weak areas or what you really need to know. And I started out with five or six books, and then the more I got into it, the, you know, they, I mean, they sell it on every type of writing, from magazine articles, I mean, everything. There's a Writer's Digest um, marketing guide that, that, that basically is this thick. And it tells you, it, it gives you the contact information of every publisher in the United States that would publish what you are interested in writing. And there's a difference between self-publishing and having a publisher do it. You know, and I've done both. The Teenage Years of Jesus Christ, the Sword of the Lord publishes for me. It doesn't cost me one dime. I get royalties from that book. Self-publishing, I pay for it all up front, but I maintain a lot more of the profits that way. Okay? So there's a difference in that. All right. Well, and again, what I said about when you teach a series and God gets in on it, I would, that was just a study I taught our teenagers. My dad, I was a youth pastor, my dad saw revival in our youth group. And he pulls me in the office and says, what are you teaching down in teen training hour? Something's going on. And I said, Dad, I got this. Let me show you what I've been teaching. He's like, Jerry, you've got to put that in print. Now, this is where I'd never written before. And it sounds easy for someone to just say, go put it in print. There, that's where I had to go self-educate so that I knew where to start to even do what Dad told me to, to do. So I said, well, I'm not going to just throw it on paper. I'm going to learn how to do it because if I'm going to do it, I want it to be done well. We self-published the first thousand copies. I took it to the Sword Conference, put it on a book table. I did not know Shelton Smith at the time. He called me two weeks later and said, hey, one of our staff picked up your book. This is incredible. This is amazing. I just got one question. Who in the world are you? And <laughs> I said, nobody, but let me give you a connection. He said, I would like the sword to take this book and publish it for you. Would you allow us to do it? Which, looking back, was a really good decision because it gave me some validity. It got my work out nationwide because, see, self-publishing sounds good, so you're going to write something, and you're going to order 1,000 copies or 1,500 copies or 2,000 copies, and you're going to get them coming to the mail. And then you're going to stack them in your utility room. And you know that they're there, and your wife knows they're there, and the little pet dog knows they're there, and nobody else in America knows they're there. <laughs> so how are you going to get them to know that they're there? And so if you self-publish, the margins sound bigger as far as profitability, but you're going to spend a certain amount of that into advertising or some way to get word out, and there's all kinds of different ways to do that. That's a whole session in itself. So, okay. I built a database of 4,000 independent Baptist churches and this church, and then we mailed snail mail to all of them, and we got all of them. Just uh, a sheet with your resources or actual samples of your resources? Just, well, not samples. Just this is what we publish. How, how, of of 4,000, what kind of response did you get of a percentage probably, wise? Maybe 15%. Yeah. Okay, welcome to the world of self publishing. <laughs> okay. All right, yeah. Uh, the, there's a place for that.
five six thousand dollars out of our pocket into it no money coming in but so uh, we we made up our mind we talked about it said all right unless god does something super we're going to quit <coughs> i got an eighteen thousand six hundred dollar order from a traveling preacher he said i've got a website and your books are selling like hotcakes on the road and he said i've got a i, I want a thousand of these books on a road that put me that put us back on the map. Guys, evangelists are your friends. If they'll carry one or two of your even if they'll carry one of your resource, everything you publish, if somebody gets this book, in the back of this book, if they decide they want to order something, that evangelist that came through that they bought it for, they're not going to call them, they're going to call me. So I and here's a way I can help support evangelists. You know, bookstores and evangelists alike, okay, forty percent off. Now, when they sell it for full price, that helps their ministry, okay? But it also scatters my material out. And everything you get out there has the potential of generating orders. So missionaries, anybody that's willing to carry anything that you have, even if they'll carry one thing that you have, if somebody buys it and likes it, they'll say, well, wonder what else he's written. And then we'll get the call, we'll get the orders, and that type of thing. Is that, is that what helps you? ship to us, then mark it up not twice, three times. Yes. Okay. Minimum of, of triple. That way then you can discount it back to the book bookstore because they have to make money on it in order to buy it from you. And it may sound greedy. If you say, okay, two dollar book and I'm gonna list it for six ninety five, that may sound greedy. But by the time you get a forty percent discount that you're given a lot of people, plus Baptists, if they're not getting a deal, they ain't buying. Even when it's on my table, I never sell anything. I've always, if, 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 that's the way we are. You know, we, we go to the clearance rack. We've been trained, okay? And so everybody wants to feel like they're getting a deal. So, you know, it is. It's just part of its marketing. But, hey amen, I'm learning some things. Good. You need anything to add? Right. Stuff because I just wanted, I wasn't trying to make a bunch of money. I wanted to get stuff out and help people. And I was asking Brother Starr, and he's like, well, 2.75. And I'm like, oh my. And I'm honest, but I was like, that's robbery. That's like, you know? And, and so I started realizing, well, I've got, right now I've got $4,700 in inventory sitting on shelves. Mm -hmm. And that's all income is for the donuts that I, I made. And it's not in my pocket. So it's on a shelf. So really, you, every time you buy or write a book, you put a lot of money into, you buy a bunch of them, and you sell, you, so you buy 500, you sell 50 to your friends. And then, and then the rest of them are just sitting there. And so you, you're really not making that back. And so you have to, you have to put some money up on the there. And I, what I also did, yeah, it was open, but then I also, there are some things that I purposely have not marked up very much at all, like the, um, the white snake. Discipleship book. That is, you know, he carries some of my books, but there's some books that I, I couldn't afford to discount. Like I, if I gave him forty percent discount, I wouldn't be making. I, I'd be losing money. Right. Because, so it's just some things I, I sell more of those, but I do that on purpose because I, I want people to get the discipleship material so that the churches can afford it and get it into people's hands. And so okay, I don't make it. But but. Okay. But don't make the mistake of undervaluing your writings. Listen, Baptists believe every verse in the Bible except the, right, the labor is worthy of his hire. We don't really believe that. And, you know, I believe that verse. And I know how much work. That, that uh, 104 lessons I just mentioned, I got 1,000 hours of my life into that first volume. 1,000 hours. It, it retails for 60 I sell it for $49. That's what we, we always, you know, again, you got to play the game. If you divide 49 dollars by a thousand hours I'm making like three cents an hour okay so I'm giving it away and I'm, I do have that heart but a lot of times our biggest mistake is we undervalue our writing and so you know what the secular publications tell you to mark up six times minimum six times 
okay, because they understand what it's, and I'm talking about self-publishing, they understand what it's going to cost to advertise and get that book out. And it sounds ridiculous when you read it. First time I read that, six times, what are they talking about? But once you start trying to get it out there, you realize why you've got to have a buffer, okay? So, good. One yeah. last thing. Our inventory now is down to practically zero, except what we carry in our motorhomes, because Congress carries and prints as orders from you. And that's what I Brother Castle to, does. I don't have Brother Castle with, uh, what's the Hilltop Publishing? Pub publication. Hill, Google Hilltop Publication. There's a man that's really assisting independent from Old Baptist. Brother Castle has, does not have to carry in, any inventory. You can order as little as how many? Quantity wise? Okay. And there's different guys do it different ways. Do your homework. It's been about an hour, brother, so I don't, I want to. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.